Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to the Deep Tech Network, jointly organized by Imperial College uh, London's Enterprise Department and the Department of Chemistry, as well as Upstream, which is where I'm from. And I'm Prema, I'm Managing Director, and Upstream is a partnership between Imperial College and Hammersmith and Fulham Council. We are a product of a local industrial strategy co-created by these two organizations. And our vision is to turn Hammersmith and Fulham into a destination for the science, tech and creative industries with a thriving ecosystem and with White City at the epicenter of an inclusive innovation district. And if not for the new level of uncertainty, we would be having mince pies, pizzas and all that. And we were meant to be in White City's um, scale space in the innovation district which is a growing hub for life sciences and a hotbed of disruptive and ambitious engineering companies, um, tech and science startups. Uh, nevertheless, um, my co-host, Sarah, who is research development manager at the Department of Chemistry, uh, together we're delighted to bring you an excellent taster of all the good stuff that you would find in the White City Innovation District, all the innovation, all the exciting stuff. And we have a fantastic lineup of five speakers today, and I'm going to introduce the first one. But before I do so, I should say our speakers have about six minutes, and then we move on to a question and answer session. Please drop your questions into the chat, and we will put them to the speakers. And we have at some point got a um, <clears throat> networking session halfway and at the end again. So our first speaker is Dr. Francesco Apriel, who and his lab research focuses on the development of biomolecules. These are molecules that are produced by living organisms and as research tools to understand disease mechanisms and for clinical applications. And in particular, they are investigating proteins and antibodies that can help them to understand why proteins aggregate in the brain and lead to so many forms of dementia. Uh, Dr. Apriel obtained his PhD from the University of Milano Biacoja in Italy and was previously a senior research fellow of the Alzheimer's Society and also was at University of Cambridge. Uh, Dr. Apriel, Francesco, do you want to make a start? Thank you very much for having me today. Uh, my name is uh, Francesco Aprile. I'm currently a UK RI Teacher Leader Fellow um, in the Department of Chemistry here at Imperial College London. And today uh, I want to tell you briefly about uh, our antibody discovery platform to uh, understand dementia. Um, so just to put you everything in, in a broader context, uh, uh, when uh, we try to tackle diseases and we try to understand their mechanism, we can do this mainly with two approaches. One is an in vitro approach, which is very detailed, but also uh, uh, sometimes oversimplistic because it works with proteins in isolation or in vivo where uh, proteins are in their true context. So for example, in animal models, but in this case, we need sometimes to sacrifice a little bit of accuracy. So we're very interested in bringing these two approaches together. And in order to do so, uh, we uh, think that antibodies are a fantastic tool for uh, uh, this purpose because uh, they allow uh, interdisciplinary research. So the same antibody can be used for in vitro and in vivo approaches. And then one can combine the, the two, the results to have uh, the whole picture of a given mechanism uh, that can be produced in a lab and they are translatable. So not only they are fantastic research tools, but they can also be used as a diagnostics and eventually as a therapeutic molecules. Um, however, there are some, some issues related with antibodies, so they can be uh, difficult to, to produce against some specific uh, biomolecules, for example, uh, post-translationally modified proteins or uh, proteins that tend to aggregate. Um, sometimes they can be expensive, particularly in the case of uh, challenging targets and uh, time consuming to make. So uh, my research group uh, wants to uh, solve these problems. And uh, to do so, we essentially have put together uh, what we call an integrative antibody discovery platform that uh, combines both computational approaches and uh, experimental ones. So specifically what we do is uh, if antibodies have that, this uh, Y shape and the binding site uh, is the tip of this Y shape, what we do is uh, we specifically uh, computationally design 
these uh, red loops, uh, which are the binding sites of the antibody. And then we take our computationally designed antibody and we do cycle, uh, cycles of uh, uh, direct devolution, which is uh, an experimental technique that mimic uh, the uh, evolution uh, uh, process of nature to optimize this antibody against the very challenging targets. So just to very quickly show you uh, one of the application, I want to tell you about one of, anti one of our antibody that we develop to uh, tackle dementia and particularly Alzheimer disease. So dementia is a, is, a very, uh, is a global challenge currently because it affects several million people worldwide and uh, costs the society a huge amount of money. And uh, uh, the, the fact that make complex dementia is that dementia is an umbrella term that refer to Alzheimer's disease, Parkinson disease, uh, frontotemporal dementia, for example. But all these forms of dementia share the formation in the brain of protein aggregates that can, can have very strange shapes and very different shapes. Some of them are fibrils, some others are rounded and small. So in particular, these small aggregates, which are called oligomers, seems to be very toxic and to cause the disease. So we have produced one antibody <clears throat> that seems to have a strong specificity for these oligomers rather than other less toxic aggregates, such as the fibrillar ones. And this is a super resolution uh, microscopy experiment where on the left side, we have an uh, image, an oligomeric sample of a protein that is related with Alzheimer's disease. And uh, on the right side, we have done the same with uh, fibrillar aggregates. And then we have conjugated a fluorophore that lights up when there are binding events. And we can see binding events only on the left side rather than on the fibrillar sample. And this experiment was in vitro, but we really like to combine in vitro and in vivo. And so just to show you um, a last application of this antibody, we're trying to do something similar in a mouse model of Alzheimer's disease. And uh, we have taken uh, mice of, of that are a good model of, of Alzheimer's disease at four, uh, three adult stages, four months, nine months, 18 months. And we have stained the brain sections with a dye, which is this dye of four, which is specific for these fibrillar aggregates, which are not very much toxic. And it's very interesting to see that there is no signal of four months when the mice are indeed quite sick. So if we use instead our antibody to do a very similar experiment, we can detect a very significant signal showing that our antibody is better than the current state of the art actually to probe these toxic protein aggregates that are formed in this case in Alzheimer's disease. And this is just one example to show you what essentially we can do with this integrative antibody discovery platform, but uh, clearly we do many other things and this is thanks to, well, a fantastic group that support my research and also to great collaborators and, and all our funders. And of course, I want to thank you for your kind attention. Thank you, Francesca. That was that was really, really interesting. Um, I have a question um, and I wondered if you could maybe explain to me a little bit more about how protein aggregates cause dementia. Yeah, sure. Um, it's, it's, so this is actually a, a very good question. Essentially what happened is that in some cases, we don't know why proteins start to aggregate in the brain. And we just know that this happened. In other cases, it's because of genetic mutations, for example. But uh, what happens is that uh, you have these proteins that should be soluble in the brain. In reality, they start to clump together and then they interact with several components of the brain. So they interact with the neuronal membranes and they start making pores so that the neuron eventually dies or they can also trigger inflammation, uh, which is very bad when it happens uh, in, in, the brain, in the brain because these, of course, trigger uh, a cascade of events. Thank you. Um, one more question. Could you maybe elaborate on the time it takes to make antibodies? I mean, are they time intensive processes? Yes. So usually uh, to make an antibody, it, takes, uh, uh, it can take a few months or in the case of challenging ones, uh, also years. Um, so this is actually where we want to uh, fill the gap, I will say. And this is why we really like to combine uh, computer design with experimental approaches because uh, computer design allows one to 
save time in the lab, essentially. What we do is we generate lead antibodies, antibody that bind already to a target, and then we use wet lab techniques to optimize the binding rather than going straight in the, into the lab and doing these wet lab direct evolution approaches that would require longer time. Thank you. Um, we have one more question. Many people debate the cause of Alzheimer's disease um, and, and the amyloid um, aggregation. What are your thoughts on the theories based on insight from your own research? So I, uh, it's an excellent question. I think that there are many causes. So clearly, I'm not going to say that protein aggregation is the only cause, uh, but uh, there is definitely a link between the presence of protein aggregates and some aggregates and neuronal deaths. On top of that, there are other mechanisms, including inflammation, which is unclear whether it is uh, the, the trigger of aggregation or the cause of the, of the uh, result of the presence of aggregates, or most likely both. So clearly, that's another important mechanism. Oxidative stress is another mechanism. People start thinking that, uh, and this is clearly ongoing research, so we need to be careful about it, but there are very interesting papers linking bacterial infection, for example, with uh, uh, some causes of uh, causing Parkinson in some cases. So th there are many factors. So uh, scientifically speaking, I would say that we need to keep uh, uh, every door open and being very open-minded which of these mechanisms we want to target. Brilliant. Thank you very much. Fascinating talk. Um, we will move on to our next speaker. Um, so we, I have the, the pleasure of introducing ex next speaker, who is Nicholas Moser, co-founder and CTO of Proton DX. Um, spun out of Imperial College in March of 2020, Proton DX is revolutionizing the world of diagnostic techs. Um, they have developed a microchip-based rapid diagnostic technology for infectious diseases, and the device can also tag results and upload them to a cloud-based system to monitor disease progression and track outbreaks. They have recently adapted the technology to test for COVID, which provides quantitative results to smartphone apps in under 20 minutes. Hi, everybody. Thank you very much for inviting me to this really exciting event. Um, so as Sarah just said, um, I'm Dr. Nick Moser, and actually I started this research in the Center for Science Biotechnology Technology under Professor Fantis Georgiou. And in the past year, I've been in the process of several entrepreneurial programs at Imperial, including at Imperial to Accelerate, MedTech Superconnector, and also the IVMS, so the mentorship program. So without further ado, what I want to talk about today is Proton DX, as Sarah said, um, trying to bring rapid, portable, and accurate infection diagnostic to um, any kind of environment. So as I said, the actual company was founded in March, 2020, but spun out in December. Um, and the current targets that we've got for the diseases are RSV, influenza, rhinovirus, and of course, COVID-19. Looking at particularly respiratory panel, but also answering the question, if it's not COVID, then what, it is, what is it? Which is very relevant nowadays um, when everybody I know is catching all sorts of flus. So just to put that into context, you're very aware that the government has very much insisted on antigen tests as those the one the ones you do at home however the problem with antigen tests is they need, they need quite a high viral load to detect the presence of the infection and therefore they're much less accurate than what we would call the molecular tests because those would be the ones targeting the dna or the rna of the disease and they're the ones that will be detecting early on after exposure to the first um, disease so to live with the virus and its variants we need molecular tests to be faster more accurate more accessible without the need for a lab and multi-pathogen. And that's kind of what we're trying to bring, rapid molecular testing for everyone at the point of need, so where it's needed without the lab, with the mission to provide kind of products that are reliable, low cost, easy to use, and, and accurate wherever people gather. The approach is kind of a combination of three main disciplines. The first one being microfluidics to provide an extremely pure DNA sample extraction from a nasopharyngeal swab. Uh, could be nasal, we're actually looking into saliva at the moment as well. Um, and then, of course, a label-free isothermal nucleic acid amplification, which is actually very similar to PCR. If you're aware of PCR, the accuracy is similar. The difference here is that it's completely isothermal, which works better to get that technology outside of the lab, and it's also more specific. And we're integrating that with microchip technology, similar to what's in your phone, but we're using that to detect very rapidly in a small format. Just want to take you through the first two kind of um, platforms that we've developed. And the first one is actually Dragonfly. 
So Dragonfly is absolutely a test that can be done outside of the lab by trained users on kind of a, any kind of bench with the concept that any tube can detect a particular target, COVID, RSV, rhinovirus, flu A, flu B. And depending on the color change, the user can see whether the patient is infected or not. Um, the accuracy matches PCR accuracy. This is kind of the general panel. So we've got a tablet to guide the user through the instructions. This is the sample preparation kits. It, in under fifth, five minutes, it um, allows the user to extract the DNA with a very pure method and then run it inside a heater. And after 25 minutes, the heater will provide the color change and therefore the results. So the total sample to result workflow is 30 minutes without the need for any additional instruments such as Vortex, all the things that you'd usually use for the sample extraction method. This is kind of the general workflow. Um, and here on the right, you can see the um, um, system for color change, which is um, pink or yellow, depending on whether it is a positive or a negative. Um, our clinical validation has been so far on the sample extraction has shown really high sensitivity and specificity. So we're currently running these on fresh samples to um, get a full accuracy for CE marking as we're releasing the product quite soon. Um, our second product, and uh, that's the one that was introduced at the very start of this talk, is lacing. So the idea is to apply the exact same methods, microfluidic sample extraction, but also the isothermal assay to this time a complete electronic platform that I've actually got here. So this is what a platform looked like, completely hand handheld. And you can see on my camera as well what the cartridge looks like with the, with the microchip here in the middle. And now the idea is we're developing a completely um, integrated sample extraction method with this device where the reaction is actually loading on top of the chip. There's no need for external instruments in this particular case, the detection is under 20 minutes and that can synchronize onto you know, might it be your mobile phone or a tablet such that it can send results and geolocate, provide, providing very helpful information to decision makers around the world. A bit like what we had at the start of the COVID pandemic, you know, some universities were releasing some passive, some um, maps relying on active reporting. The idea being for the next pandemic or for this pandemic, as a matter of fact, to have all this information live. This is what the workflow currently looks like. It's a 15, 20 minutes workflow, but we're currently working on um, integrating step one and step two together to have the sample extraction we've shown um, as, a, as one part. The general roadmap for the company is to commercialize the Dragonfly product that I showed you the first one very early on, so it's actually next month, um, and we're well on route to doing that. And then after that, we'll be working on um, commercialization of lacing, particularly. Some of the you know, deployment targets we have are education, care homes, but also the sports industry. Um, and in terms of health center, particularly pharmacies as well. So places where we can um, have trained users um, use, use Dragonfly. Um, so overall, the idea is to leverage the combination of all these techniques to create kind of multivariate, multi-material diagnostic platform further to respiratory pathogens. Not only that, but there'll be a lot of offerings after this that'd be interesting. So these are kind of the management team. So I've said Professor Giorgio has been my PI since the very start. Uh, Dr. Jesus Soles Manzano, who's a lecturer in, in medicine, has developed the Azdemol assay, and we've brought in Bob Eng as part of an investment to work on the commercial side as chairman and president of the company. And that's all from me. Thank you very much for, for your attention. For, for your attention. Nick, thank you so much. Um, where is the product going to be manufactured? Out of curiosity. Um, right, so this is actually a very big network of companies that are working on this. Um, we're working with uh, companies for particularly bead manufacturing because all the reagents are hydrated, are dehydrated, sorry, as part of lyophilized beads. Uh, so we've got companies for that, we've got companies for assemblies, for the strips, um, and then now we're working with all the chip companies and electronic companies as well. I, I'm, I'm not giving names yet because we're kind of figuring that all out as well, but... And then the second question is, you know, having launched in March 2020, tricky time, yes. um, how has the pandemic influenced your company's growth and market adoption? A lot. So I didn't say this, but originally as researchers, um, so what we came at first was lacing. So the second product I showed here, the handheld platform. And originally this was meant to be applied in tropical countries for diseases such as dengue, malaria, where the resources are quite limited. Um, now, it's still very much the case. It's still very much something we want to do in the future. But because of the pandemic, we've repurposed for COVID and we've really used it as a way to 
developed faster and it's definitely had that effect um also finding investors everything you know going from a research group to a company has been much faster thanks to COVID. and actually although we created the company in march 2020 we spun out in december 2020 so that's exactly a year ago from imperial wow <laughs> it's, it's been a that, long that's year that's tremendous really tremendous very tremendous. Okay, um, another question, which is, you know, early in the COVID outbreak, testing was lacking, and that, you know, testing was lacking, which may have helped control outbreaks. Do you think your technology could have been quickly adapted to test for a new virus? I think that's the advantage of molecular tests. It's quite easy to repurpose them for new targets. May may they be emerging targets or new variants and so on. Um, so the design is actually um, it's called it's primer design, so it's a particular enzyme that's present in the reaction that needs to be specific to what you're looking for. As a result, it's quite easy in a few weeks to adapt it. So absolutely, I think what what we see this as is a platform. And then after that, it's easy to repurpose it, have different types of cartridge for, for a panel of infections and so on. Okay, great. Nick? Thank you so much. Um, if, if anybody's got any other questions, you can drop them in the chat. I know some of our speakers have been kind enough to stay on and you know type their answers into the chat. Nick, thank you so much and tremendous work. Well done and good thank luck you. with everything you're doing. Yeah. So I would like to introduce our next speaker, um, Anne Rocks. She's the Translational Project Manager um, at the MSK Accelerator in the Department of Bioengineering at Imperial College. And if it's okay, I'll probably introduce you and then um, Lance later. So Anne has, has um, provided industry-inspired product development support to translational products selected through an established process including a review by a panel of medtech experts. Um, the projects greatly benefit from the industrial partnership and commercializations team's advice and the translation culture at Imperial College. Um, the support provided um, includes um, ISO 13485 certified quality management system for the design and development of medical devices and a tailored project management function. So um, thank you for the introduction. Um, so I'm a bit unusual, I guess, here. I'm going to talk to you about a program we've established at Imperial College, the Musculoskeletal Accelerator. So this was um, established by four professor at the Med Musculoskeletal Medical Engineering Center, which is across Faculty of Engineering and Medicine in Imperial. And those professors got some funding from Wellcome Trust to try and establish an industry-inspired model to improve translation of their research into medical device products. Um, so that structure, as, as you briefly said, it includes a management committee. We, we want to be um, inclusive of, of, of course, the tech transfer team on IP, and we've established a quality management system, which I'll, I'll go briefly into, and a project management function for the project. So um, we provide, um, we se select project competitively through um, a review with a met an expert um, panel, which is form of external um, industry expert. And they also provide advice to the project. So what are the best next steps? It's an action plan that we then monitor. So we provide sustained support. There's a bit of funding, but also we try and also, um, you know, be very interfacing and signposting the ecosystem at Imperial, which is very rich. So there's the NHS Trust, of course, the enterprise team and entrepreneurship programs, which are great and programs such as the, the Deep Tech Network here. And we also want to be um, outward facing. So we want to collaborate with industry. We talk to industry, uh, we talk to regulatory experts, which is very important for medical devices, which you know the startup will probably tell you that's, that's normally a big headache. And then we want to help them get some translational funding. So we have KPI that we measure. We, we try and increase the TRL level of projects to try and get them to move, move up um, that technology level um, we want to form startups collaboration with industry or licensing deals and we want to increase translational funding as well as first in man studies if we can so we want to benefit imperial college through having more translational funding come in but also we hope that it can help um, technologies get to market quicker so it's a quicker return and for the early career researchers of course uh, we hope that provides um, an experience in product development for a medical device so this is just to give you a oh sorry went too fast a quick uh, slide on the technologies we have at the moment. So they're deep tech because they've been researched at the university for many years, 
And then we just suddenly focus on, we've got to develop a product, what, what's the product idea? And, and this il illustrates some of the products here that we're working on. So we, for, we formed the accelerator in January 2018. We've got this quality management system for the design and development of medical devices. And that's now certified to ISO 13485. So that's a little bit boring. It's the standard that industry uses to uh, place devices on the market. Um, and we hope that we give a head, a head start really to the startup and DCRs on the program. We've formed two startups and then a third one forming. We've got three RA Engine Enterprise Fellows in the program. We've raised uh, about 2.4 million um, in translational funding for, for the project specifically. And we've had a renewal um, from, from Welcome Trust. So we will continue and expand the model to all MedTech at Imperial. And that will be based at Y City. So the, the name is MedTech One, um, hopefully starting next year. And finally, a brief note on the QMS. It's, it's a system. So it's a set of procedures, forms that help people do things in a certain way. So we try and do that um, with DCRs and it gives them some, some control over how they do design and also how they do risk management and other things like um, traceability is in there as well. So thank you for the attention um, and over to Lance now. Lance is a medical doctor who works in the NHS and elsewhere for several years before switching to engineering. Um, after his PhD in the Department of Bioengineering, he founded Biomex, an imperial spin-out to commercialize his research combining neuromuscular electrical stimulation and AI. So Biomex is developing wearable devices for patients with osteoarthritis and athletes following sports injury. Great, thanks very much, Sarah, for the introduction. Um, so my name is Lance Rain. I am um, CEO of Biomex, which is a spin out from the Department of Bioengineering at Imperial. And I'm going to talk about our work towards developing wearable functional electrical stimulation for rehabilitation applications. So um, our technology works by changing muscle contractions through the application of electrical stimulation to specific muscles of a patient in a precisely timed manner. So our device takes the form of a pair of shorts, which integrates electrodes and sensors and a microcomputer. And for one setup, the system's autonomous. So we get motion data in from the sensors. This is fed into an onboard algorithm to determine the timing of stimulation in real time. So our system enables the external modulation of movement. So there, there, there are many applications for that kind of technology, but we're focusing on two. Firstly, um, ACL injury in elite athletes, and secondly, rehabilitation in patients with osteoarthritis of the knee. So looking at OA um, osteoarthritis specifically, um, our device falls into the category of biomechanical treatments. And um, there are several biomechanical treatments currently on the, on the market, um, but ours offers a number of, of advantages over existing treatments, which um, have failed to achieve widespread uptake because of problems related to bulk and discomfort and also limited patient eligibility. So moving on to um, the underlying tech now, our technology centers around uh, motion data which is collected by our device as it is worn by patients. So offline, we're able to analyze these data to assess things like rehabilitation progress and disease severity. And the sports clubs that we're working with are particularly interested in, in, these, in these use cases. We ultimately aim to provide the data and analytics online via um, dashboards to these clubs on a player by player basis. So after processing the data, we use it to train machine learning models, which are customized for efficiency to allow their deployment to our battery powered hardware. And then once deployed onto our devices, um, these models read incoming data and determine the timing of stimulation to coordinate with the patient's movements in real time. 
So right now we're at the right hand edge of this timeline, um, but the research underpinning our device was performed some time ago now in 2015 during my MSc um, in the Department of Bioengineering. Um, soon after that MSc, we filed a patent covering this as a new method of treatment in our two patient groups, and this patent has since been granted. Following that, after completing a PhD, I started um, a uh, enterprise fellowship with the Royal Academy of Engineering at Imperial, and we were able to gain the support of the MSK Accelerator, which I just introduced. It's helped to kickstart the commercialization, commercialization efforts for the project. We developed our first prototype soon after and soon spun out Biomex to lead these commercialization efforts, um, negotiating a license with Imperial uh, for the underlying pattern in the process. In order to fund ongoing development, Biomex together with Imperial applied for and successfully gained an Innovate UK Smart Grant, which we have been working under since late 2022, building our advanced prototype for patients with osteoarthritis. So these projects, as um, some of the audience may know, uh, they demand a match funding component, uh, which means that some of the funding must be provided by the startup. We were lucky enough to gain the support of a, an angel investor around the same time to provide that. So we're currently de developing this advanced prototype. Um, this includes a custom garment, machine learning system, mobile app, and online analytics dashboards. And we uh, recently uh, underwent a, an IPO that, and we're currently in the process of patenting a number of developments related to this system. I just wanted to finish uh, again, coming back to the NSK Accelerator, which Anne spoke about already, because it's helped us in, in, in a number of ways. Um, firstly, through the QMS, which, which Anne introduced. So we're, we're now looking to perform clinical validation studies in patients. And the QMS is, is going to be really helpful for that to ensure that we have all of the um, requisite documentation in place as we look to gain the approvals. Um, secondly, the funding it was really helpful, particularly in the early stages, to get us through the early prototyping phases and to perform some consulting work around the prototypes as well. And finally, I just wanted to mention that in applying for grants like Innovate UK, we have found that having this association with the accelerator at Imperial has really been uh, beneficial. We think it's something which has come up again and again in, in the feedback from, from those applications. So uh, yeah, thanks very much for listening and thanks to the Food Tech Network for inviting me to speak. Lance, uh, thank you so much. I'm always very interested when somebody talks about uh, knee osteoarthritis because uh, that's something I suffer from. Um, I was wondering if we might uh, put a couple of questions to you, then turn back to Anne. So you you were talking about what sounds like two markets, which is around elite athletes clubs, and then is there a wider, more generic market, like people like me? Or yes. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, our primary market and the main goal for us from the beginning was the OA application. I think it's, it's really important mm -hmm. and there's a real kind of gap in, in the range of treatments available before surgery becomes um, suitable for patients. So in the early stages of, of the disease, there's a real lack of treatments there. We, we developed the, the sports injury application with taking on advice from uh, various stakeholders, the, the accelerator, the board at, of Imperial College Innovations as well, who rightly pointed out that to get to market for a medical device and for the OA se segment would take many years and therefore it would be helpful to have a kind of stepping stone goal in, in the interim to enable us to generate revenue to support our ultimate goal of, of getting to, to getting into the OA market, which because of the clinical trials, which required, requires a lot of money. Um, so as a result of that, the, the, the sports injury came about as this kind of stepping stone market and an easier market to get into, we hope. Okay, great. And um, at what stage of, um, you know, uh, again, we're going back to the OA question, which is uh, at what point can you actually continue to rehabilitate and at which point is, are, are things perhaps set if somebody suffered from OA for quite a number of years? And, you know, is there... Is there always a going back? Can, can you always give them some degree of progress? Um, so I think there's always um, benefit to be 
had, um, although the research in this is pretty lacking, if I'm honest. Mm -hmm. um, we, we think that the most, the greatest amount of benefits to be gained from intervening in, in the early stages and the research that is out there does, does support that. And um, that feeds in nicely to the kind of business model, which is um, to prevent progression of disease and therefore pr prevent the rate of requirement of uh, knee surgery. In order to do that, you, you need to intervene early if possible to, to prevent um, patients from requiring surgery ultimately. Right, thank you. Um, I'm sounding less optimistic. Now, uh, we've got a question from Aaron in the chat uh, who says, with biomechanics being a poor predictor of pain and injury due to the complexity and following, uh, following a biopsychosocial model, are you going to track any other variables? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, so we so we think this varies quite a bit between different interventions. So uh, I didn't really go into the research um, underlying the device because I didn't have time. But essentially, we aim to to reduce biomechanical. So we we aim to improve biomechanical measures in patients specifically the loading at the knee, which we think is pretty well evidenced to lead to um, certainly in, improved prognosis in, in patients. There's also good evidence in the domain of knee braces, which are our kind of closest, uh, most similar device on the market currently, I think, which also uh, reduce knee forces. There's pretty good evidence for those that they also reduce pain and symptoms and, and often improve function in patients and, and that's reflected in, in their um, endorsement in various clinical guidelines. The problem with the braces is that they're not, they're not um, particularly, uh, they're not complied with very well by patients because patients find, often find them too bulky or, or uncomfortable. So we're basically aiming to replicate the biomechanical effects of um, knee braces and therefore unlock the kind of symptomatic benefits of those knee braces without, without the drawbacks of, of knee braces. Lance, thank you so much. Good luck with your research. Uh, obviously, I have a bit more of a personal interest. Um, and I was wondering if we might just go back to Anne. And uh, the question here is, how long is the accelerator program? How long do you anticipate giving people support for, or is it on an ongoing basis? Yeah, so that's that's a very good question. We, we give support to, to the, the project themselves until we they can stand on their own two feet within the start, startups, I think, and so that's, um, yeah, it can take a few years really before um, we, we really um, stop the support altogether. And sometimes the support is partly just um, keeping in touch with, with myself as the project manager, giving a little bit on the regulatory side. So it stops being funding. It becomes more a bit of advice and, and being in touch really um, after, after the, the startups have formed, but we're still there for them. And in terms of the accelerator model, we need to find sustainability. So that's really a big part of the next phase of our program. Yeah, that's that's a very good question. So we're working, we'll be integrating with enterprise at, at Imperial as well. Um, and hopefully we can we can uh, develop that sustainability model. Super. And thank you for your work and for talking about the program. It sounds really interesting and good luck with the next stages. Um, I'm going to introduce our next speaker, who is Thomas Antelfi, who is a founder and CEO of Smart Respiratory, which is a digital healthcare company based in the Imperial White City Incubator. Um, Smart Respiratory's Smart Peak Flow Meter uh, turns into a smartphone, uh, turns your smartphone rather into a handy personal asthma assistant. And by tracking an asthmatic's breathing, it can warn its users of an impending attack. Thomas, are you ready to share your slides? And again, I declare an interest, asthmatic as well. Absolutely, and I, I won't have many slides. Uh, our, our story is not so much about uh, product discovery, like some of the, the, the founders who, who, who preceded me, but uh, ours is more about product market fit. Uh, when we joined Imperial iHub, we already had the core product uh, developed and, and market ready. Um, the, the, our market is, is people with asthma, which is almost 10% of the UK population. Uh, so it's, it's, it's quite frequent to keep track of their asthma. People are, are traditionally given a device like this, which is called the peak flow meter. This is a little uh, tubey cylinder thing. You blow into it and then the little red pointer shows what your, what your peak flow is now. 
uh, and then you get a piece of uh, crinkly sheet like that with it. Uh, so you write down your peak flow recordings and the peak flow is how fast you can blow out air, uh, which is simply a measure of the obstruction of your airway. So people with asthma, their, their lung capacity is intact, but the airways have narrowed. So through narrower airways, the air comes out slower. So that's what a peak flow meter does. Uh, our peak flow meter, the, the smart peak flow device looks like that, um, which is commercially available. It, it looks like this out of the package. It's a little rotary turbine with uh, an audio jack on it. It plugs into my phone. Uh, it comes, comes with our app. I blow into it and it measures my peak flow, records it uh, and charts it so I can see or share my asthma chart with my doctor without having to write it down and, and having to record it. So that looks, it doesn't cost significantly more to manufacture than a mechanical peak flow meter. So we, we thought that's pretty straightforward. Uh, and it turns out it, it was straightforward as a tech gadget, but uh, as, as a healthcare product, there's a lot higher bar to pass. Um, our, our initial uh, uh, pivot was to go from measuring peak flow only to measuring or recording peak flow as well as symptoms, as well as reliever inhaler use. So we measured three, three markers in parallel. Um, the, the second thing we did is once all this data was digitized, we could use it for all kinds of smart things, including predicting your, your lung condition and your asthma control. Uh, we, we both have a short-term prediction, which is AI-based. Uh, we have over a million peak flow measurements in our cloud, and we can predict your peak flow zone for tomorrow with over 90% accuracy. And then we have a medium term uh, prediction, which is based on a statistical diary events uh, research by AstraZeneca. So we can, we can give uh, validated uh, the proofs of your asthma not being well controlled. Um, as to the patient, and then we added a, 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 an additional layer sharing this data with clinicians. So we, we, we produce a, a, a chart that looks like this, um, which, we, which we can send to clinicians and becomes part of electronic health record. This is the patient's asthma diary for the last 30 days. Uh, the blue squiggly line here is their peak flow, the lung function test, which I just showed you. Uh, down here, the numbers show peak flow variability, that's the intraday variability. Um, the pink bars are symptoms. So one is mild, two is moderate, three is severe symptoms. And the gray bars are relief rain here, a they took. Uh, and then down here, you can see these five arrows are what are called complex diary events. Uh, which some of these days don't look that different to the other days, but we know from statistical analysis that the asthma of these, these people was not well controlled on these days. Um, so with, with this, we, we, we thought we have something irresistible for the medical profession. Um, and the medical profession loves what we do, but changing their work habits and their, their workflow is uh, another hurdle. Um, so most recently we've been, we've been providing asthma monitoring or started providing asthma monitoring as a service to hospitals in the NHS. So we, we don't even give them the device. We send the device directly to the patients. We help the patients set up uh, and we send the charts to doctors. So this is, this is what the patient's asthma has been doing. Um, so it has been a process of multiple pivots and, uh, and starting with a, I think compared to the research of some of my, my, my you know, co-incubated companies, this is a, a very simple and easy to understand device and service. Uh, and, but introducing this into healthcare is a whole new uh, level of complexity. Um, and I, I'd say, you know, being, in, in, being incubated in the iHub gave us, gave us really good contacts within Imperial. So we're working with the Imperial researchers on research projects, some of them for COPD and, and other areas. Uh, we're working on clinical trials and tests uh, with, with Royal Brompton and St. Mary's. And that's also really helpful. We, have, we, we went to produce a number of publications working with researchers from St. Mary's and other hospitals. So that's all, all part of the, the, the acceptance of a, a medical product. Uh, in, a, in a few weeks time, early January, we'll have our nice uh, review of our product and finally get, get these, uh, uh, yeah, I can see from, 
uh, <laughs> agreeing that that's a big step. It is a big step we know now, but as a, as a, as a, as a crazy inventor, we thought I've got this device and look, look how much better this is than that. You know, this is obvious, uh, but so, you know, something that might be obvious to the, the inventor uh, is not trivial once it becomes healthcare. Thank you. That was that was incredible. I think everyone thoroughly appreciated the live demonstration. It's easy to see. I think why why, why I, I had a look on your webpage and actually you can see the reviews. People are actually finding it easy to manage their asthma. So I guess ultimately you're probably saving the NHS in terms of people being able to self manage more effectively because they are able to. You know, I guess it's an easier mechanism. It's portable. They could take it around. Uh, absolutely. I think my point was that the the testimonials or videos or or, or placed or reviews that convince you and me, but then it's just want uh, uh, health economics arguments. They want to see a large randomized control trial that showed how much money they save, which is the which is the whole you know a whole new bar to pass. Possibly a silly question, but have you been talking to Asthma UK at all? Yep, Asthma UK are really friendly, but they don't get involved in anything commercial. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> what what do you think that you need to break through so the product is more is used more widely um uh, i mean i guess patients that use it clearly they see the benefit immediately but do you think there's anything that's required so you can kind of expand that more quickly to a wider yeah we 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 sell some products uh, b2c so you go on amazon and you can buy it uh, but this being healthcare, uh, the, it is driven mostly by doctors and doctors' recommendations. Uh, and also B2C is difficult because in, in the UK, we have the culture of the NHS uh, being free forever for everyone and everything. So if, if we say, you know, you get this for 9.50 on prescription and you, or you could buy this for 15 quid, you say, ooh, 15 quid. Mm. <laughs> uh, so it's... Uh, um, um, <laughs> Uh, it, it, it goes through doctors. So we, we mostly have contacts with doctors and respiratory nurses who recommend our product. In the meantime, I got a question about the Bluetooth enabling our device because not everyone has a phone with yes. an audio jack. And yes, for those people who have phones that cost uh, uh, a thousand pounds and don't have an, an audio jack on them, we have a Bluetooth adapter that looks like that. Um, so you, you plug the device into this. And then the, and this connects to your phone. Amazing. So then 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 it then it, it becomes a handheld device like that. I don't know if we've got time for another quick question, but I will Absolutely. ask it anyway. Um, <laughs> do you, how how did you actually come up with the idea that you could use a smartphone to create a product that was then portable to solve this problem? Is it? I mean, how did that how did that sort of product ideation start? Um, with another company, we were doing uh, promotional work for GSK, uh, promoting their inhalers in 80 countries around the world. And uh, one of their major inhalers was going off patent protection. And we were thinking of, uh, this was promoting to doctors. And we were thinking that how to help them market the product, which now had generic alternatives. And, and then the idea was that it would make the product really useful if, if with the inhaler, you got a, a, a small uh, peak flow meter that, that patients could use. So, so we said, you know, we, we, every time you buy inhaler, you could get one of these with it because it's, it's, you know, it's a few pounds to manufacture. Um, and, uh, and that would give, give patients an, an additional asthma control tool and it would help, help the, the drug company to go beyond the pill or beyond the drug into providing a more comprehensive service. Um, the idea was way above their view of the world. Uh, but by that time we've done enough testing with patients and doctors to decide that this has legs of its own and we can develop it into a, a product or company of its own. Amazing. Thank you. I think that was an incredible, really interesting list of talks. Um, please do sign up to the DTN mailing list. Um, I will send a link in the chat now. And, and in terms of upcoming events, I'd like to mention um, Upstream has a coffee club on the 27th of January, um, 10 to 10.30, where actually it's just another opportunity to build new connections and chat with the team about any advice that you need. We will also have within chemistry some drop-in clinics that people, if you want to, can drop in. They will be rolling sort of monthly clinics probably an hour long I, I could send out I mean that will be probably advertised through upstream as well in the coming weeks yeah. um, thank you so much um, for all of your for, for the networking session and, and for some really really interesting talks